now I'll be telling you about parts of the body. So here you see there is uh, the upper leg. Upper leg, you know. Uh, let me draw here is a uh, many brim. You know what is this many brim? The upper portion of the breastbone, upper portion of the sternum, right? Okay, so here you know there is this beauty bone. This is called the clavicle. The first bone I'm telling you of the upper limb is the clavicle. In fact, it's the first bone that is that starts causing the embryo. Okay, so from this, you know, behind this there will be scapula, and onto this scapula there is this glenoid phase. To that is this scapula attached posteriorly behind. Also, there is the an attachment of <coughs> the humerus. This is the axial bone of the arm. The axial bone of the arm. So you have seen here it is this the humerus. Then to this lately placed hemispherical and the lower end of the human is that capitalism to that is attached here the radius the radius is attached to this and to the trochlea the trochlea is this almanast now as I was telling Focus here. If this clavicle would have been fractured, like you know, imagine if this gets fractured, what will happen? The pull, you know, the purpose of this was actually to pull the upper limbs towards the axial skeleton. So it's acting as a stretch. If this fractures, your shoulder droops down, and with that, the limb gets approximated. So one is this advantage, right? The other thing was that if you see the long axis the long axis of the humerus is like this <coughs> and the long axis of the ulna is slightly lately deviated with that there is a formation of an angle and that angle or between the angle of arm and forearm this angle here is called carrying angle carrying angle I told you the carrying angle is formed here so that this long axis of the forearm literally deviates from the long axis of the arm and the purpose is so that your hand will free from the hips so this angle is somewhat around 14 degrees in males but in a female it is a little more right in females it is around 15 to 16 degrees um, 15 to 16 degrees in females. Why more in females? Of course, because of the wider pelvis, wider hips. Now, that also you should know because many people don't have this idea that the reason of carrying an angle more in females is it only because of the wider pelvis, wider hips, or something else? So let's have a look here. You know, this is let's say the right. This is the ASI is the inguinal ligament, right? And here you know is the acetabulum. This is the acetabulum. And to this acetabulum, there is this head of femur. There is this head of femur. And to the head of femur, there is this. What is this? 
this is <coughs> the fever attacks. Right? This is fever attacks. So, what is the little most thing in a person, like even in mates? If you disarticulate the upper lip, let's say, which is the most little bony prominence in a human being, means what? If you keep on moving towards the wall, the first bony thing that touches the wall will be the most little bony prominence. And what that? It's the acromion process. Got it? But if you disarticulate the upper lips, man, and then a person keeps moving towards the wall, the next thing that will touch the wall will be this, not the pelvic girdle, but the greater trochanters of the femur. So remember, the greater trochanter, this is the greater trochanter of femur. This is the second most little bony prominence. So, you are it up and remember, in, if, if I say, if I draw a two femur, let's say, I'm drawing is two femur. This is one femur and this is the other femur. Which is, which femur is like a, from a male caravan? on what is found, female. Is this male or female? I mean, let's ask it, which is a female? Female, femur, male, right? First one or the second one? You must be knowing if you have already studied about this, that the carrying in this here, this next sharp angle, this next sharp angle is more in, it is more in, males and it is less in females so if you if you imagine if you compress something the angulation if you compress the angulation will be the resultant vector curve the resultant vector move this way and that leads to the greater trochanter to be shifted out more laterally in females so being less of neck sharp angle in females the greater trochanter in female femur is shifted out more laterally and that makes this curve more prominent on the hip side. So one reason was this and second reason of course is the wider pelvis, the wider pelvis. <coughs> this pelvis also makes the, you know, this is also one reason, right? The wider pelvis, of course, is one another reason. Wider pelvis. So the two reasons which makes the carrying angle more in females is the wider pelvis and the greater trochanter being more late. Okay, then what you're seeing here at the wrist, remember what I said? Then the wrist, what happens is like your hands are adapted. Your anatomical position, the hands are not like the the longitudinal axis of the forearm and hand is not the same, not in an alignment. Rather, it's not like even this, not like even this. Your hand is slightly erected, right? If you set your hands free at ease, you'll find that your, uh, you know, other side, the little finger side, it's erected. And the reason, the bony reason is, remember, this deloid process of radius and ulna, right? The, the distal ends of radius and ulna. If you palpate the radius, uh, the steroid process of radius and ulna, which is more distal, the reason makes this angulation. So remember that the steroid process of radius, the steroid process of radius is around one centimeter distal to the steroid process of ulna. So if the steroid process of radius is distal, what it will do? It will push the hand towards the other side. Right? So that makes your hand at, at ease. So this is another important fact that you are getting as a part of a human being upper limbs. Thumb, everything about the thumb I have told you. Yeah, so I was talking about the parts of the upper limbs.
So part of the upper limbs one is like you know the heading here is now we have thought about we have talked about the evolution of upper limb. Next is about the parts of upper limb. So parts of the upper limb one is the fixed portion and that is called the shoulder region. Shoulder region is this region. It's a fixed thing, so it is the fixed portion. <coughs> this is the fixed portion of the upper limbs. Then you have is the brachium, brachium or the arm. It's freely suspended. Then you have anti brachium. This is the forearm. This also is fully suspended. Then you have the hand or the manus. This also is free. All of it is freely suspended. This is all freely suspended. Now talking about the shoulder region. Shoulder region is all this like fixed portion of the upper leg. You know what actually when we say about thorax. What virtually appears above the diaphragm is not only that, you know, the part of the trunk above the diaphragm is said to be the thorax, but it's not so actually. Much of the portion of the thorax has been occupied by the, you know, shoulder region, the pectoral, the scapular region, right? The thorax actually is a uh, bony cage and it is truncated above, right? So the, the two sides here, it's part of upper limbs. So thorax upper end is not that much wide as it appears to be because it's truncated the rest of the portion you're seeing here it's the part of the upper end so shoulder region actually we call it as the different parts of the pectoral region the region of this shoulder portion here anteriorly is called the pectoral region and in this we study about the breast as one of the major structures here, but much part of the superficial fascia here. We'll study about that. Then you have behind the scapular region. Scapular region is like you know, this, this triangular plate of bone behind, and the muscles surrounding it, the portion of the back, like you know, that we'll study in the part of scapular region. Then you have this axilla. Axilla is that portion between the little uh, portion of the chest wall and the middle portion of the arm. Right? So it also is a you know, pyramidal uh, cave like thing which is truncated above. It's a truncated pyramid, pyramidal space here between the arm and the upper, upper portion of the chest. Okay, and then of course the shoulder joint that. Shoulder, shoulder joint. Now, breaking or the arm is that portion between shoulder and the elbow joint. That portion is the arm. And the axial bone, the only bone here is the humerus. Then, talking about here, you know, this was the pectoral region. This is the pectoral region in front. Here behind you have is the scapular region and here in between this space is called the axilla. This portion is the shoulder region, shoulder actually and this is the arm or the anti -brachial. Now this elbow, this elbow has another name, this is called cubitus. This is called cubitis. Cubitis is another name for the elbow. And between elbow and now this portion here, the wrist, which you call a wrist, the wrist is actually also called carpus. So between the cubitis and carpus, between elbow and wrist, that portion is the anti breaking of the forearm. Then listen to that is called the manus. This is called manus. Manus is the hand. 
right? Already mentioned there. And this, the, the first digit, you know, when we count the digits in the upper limb, we count them from major to medial, right? First, second, third, fourth, fifth. This numbering is from lateral to medial. Why lateral to the medial? Because this, I'll tell you about the immunological aspect of this development of upper limbs. It's a pre axial border that the thumb develops. And the pre axial border is towards the cephalic end. And the post axial border is towards the coral end. Right? Then the upper limb buds rotate laterally. So this moves out laterally. While in the lower limbs, the buds rotate medially. So the pre axial border faces medially. So the greater toe in the toes is medial. And there we start numbering from medial to lateral if you talk about the toes. But in the upper limbs, we number them from lateral to medial. So the first digit that is the thumb, this thumb is called pollex. Right? In the toes, it is called hallux, the greater toe. The rest of the, them are the digits. The rest of them are called the digits. Right? This is called the foremost digit. Right? Four finger, middle finger, ring finger, little finger. That was about the rough, you know, the superficial things that I have taught you is different parts, the upper limbs, and the important points that was which covered in this. The important bones, remember, there are bones if you take talk about they this carpus made up of like you know, they are arranged in four. Uh, two rows, these are carpal bones, carpal bones that form the part of the wrist, right? And part of the hand proximal, and they are arranged like you know, there are eight carpal bones, four in the proximal, four in the distal row. However, the PC formula is not in a linear arrangement, I'll tell you that is on the palmar surface, but <coughs> they are arranged in two, four proximal, four distal. That's how there are eight carpal bones. And then you have in the metacarpals, right? You have the metacarpals. You have five metacarpals. And then you have in the phalanges. Phalanges, you have three phalanges in each of the digits. Three phalanges in each of the digits, except the first one. So there are 14 phalanges. Three in each of the digits, proximal, distal, and a middle one. But in the thumb, you have only two digits, two phalanges, the distal and the proximal. Uh, actually speaking, if you go to my the previous lecture about the going into long bones, there I taught you there was a significance of this first metacarpal. First metacarpal actually developmentally behaves like a proximal phalange of the thumb. So considering that. There are also three phalanges, but first uh, metacarpal actually turns out to be uh, metacarpal later on, but developmentally it behaves like a proximal phalange of the thumb. So this was enough for today. I'll be teaching the next topic next. Thank you.